On July 4th, 1584, English explorers sent by Sir Walter Raleigh landed on Roanoke Island in what is now the area known as the Outer Banks, North Carolina. Roughly eight miles long and two miles wide, the little island lies just about two miles off Man's Harbor on the mainland and less than a mile from the Barrier Islands near Nags Head. Good spot for a settlement. Barrier Islands protecting you from the full fury of the Atlantic and a couple miles of water between you and possible hostile forces on the mainland. The fortification possibilities of an island with easy canoe access to the mainland. After an initial botched attempt to establish a settlement there, Raleigh sent a second group of colonists in 1587 led by John White. With him, he brought his adult daughter, Eleanor White Dare, his son-in-law, uh, Ananias, a stonemason. Soon after they arrived, Dare gave birth to a daughter who she named Virginia. And Virginia Dare was the first English child to be born in the present-day United States. The 117 colonists of this second attempt arrived too late to plant crops, and their situation quickly grew desperate. They persuaded White to return to England to plead for help. It didn't work. White arrived amid the Anglo-Spanish War, meaning every English ship had been commandeered to fight the Spanish Armada. White wouldn't return to Roanoke for three years. When he finally did make it back, he found the Roanoke colony utterly vacant and strangely so. There were no skeletal remains indicating that settlers had been attacked. Also, the fort had been carefully dismantled, showing that they hadn't left in a hurry. And on a fence post, someone had carved the word Croatoan, the name of a group of American Indians nearby. And scholars, archaeologists, and others have been trying to figure out what the hell happened to those first colonists ever since. Where did they go? What was their fate? Let's dig into the most enduring and vexing mystery of pre-colonial American life today on a perplexing edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, time suckers. Hail Nimrod, Bojangles, and Lucifina, and praise Pootie, Juju, and Triple M. Beware Chikatilo and Chicken Joe. Those are the ones you got to keep your eyes on. Those are the ones you got to watch out for. Get out of here, you dirtbags. I'm Dan Cummins, the master sucker, the prophet of Nimrod. He has many nicknames, and you, fellow Meat Sack, are listening to Time Suck. Recording today in the Suck Dungeon, this fine fall day with Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley and Queen of the Suck, Lindsey Cummins, in advance of the shows that I now will have had at Helium in Portland, Oregon this past weekend. I hope they were splendid. I hope they were the absolute best. And I hope my shows this Friday and Saturday in Huntington Beach are even better at the Rec Room. And then my shows next week in Tacoma, Washington, also just as great. Uh, coming up soon. Uh, Flat Earth Tour show, uh, stand-up shows and a live Time Suck podcast at the Tacoma Comedy Club, October 11th through the 14th. Links to the tickets always in the episode descriptions. Uh, Joe Pays, going to be with me, the Reverend Doctor, on the 14th. Uh, thanks for the continued reviews, and thanks for continuing to spread the suck, you guys. You guys and gals, it's so exciting. Uh, more and more often now, I hear uh, Time Suckers, you know, uh, tell me about other people uh, that they're talking to. You know, they tell them that they're listening to uh, Time Suck, and then those people are like, oh, yeah, no, I know about Time Suck. Yeah, I listen too. That's a great sign of growth, and it's just that much more motivation to keep giving my best to the suck. It's been such a fun ride, and the ride continues in Columbus, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, Spokane, Washington, St. Louis, Missouri, Grand Rapids, Michigan for the rest of 2018. All dates and available tickets listed at dancummins.tv. Uh, thanks to everyone who's been grabbing the new merch. New hoodies have been especially popular. People loving that lemur belly button and King Cobra face skin. Uh, thanks to Access Apparel for giving the Shopify store a facelift as well. Getting it to look uh, so fresh, so clean. And, uh, and that's all uh, the announcements for today. How, how about that? How about it? I know last week I had a lot, so this week uh, let's keep it short. Got to balance content and commerce. So, dear listener, without further ado, let's dig into today's mystery, The Lost Colony of Roanoke. Roanoke, a long-requested topic, the Lost Colony. What's going on over there? Well, today it's a series of picturesque little coastal communities. There is the gorgeous little 1,400-person town of uh, Manteo, North Carolina, that sits towards the northern end of the island, just over three miles from where the original colony was built on the northern tip. Feeling pretty good about that pronunciation. Uh, had a lot of people write in. We'll be talking about it in the uh, updates. A lot of pronunciation mistakes with Andrew Jackson, uh, especially around the Carolinas, apparently. So I got a, someone sent in a North Carolina pronunciation guide. And you know what? I used it. Uh, yeah, Mantillo, uh, named after a big player in today's story, uh, an American Indian chief named Mantillo, a member of the Croatoan tribe, uh, 
Mantillo had uh, been to, taken to London in 1584, where he and another uh, Indian, Juan Chis, the last known chief of the Roanoke tribe that the island is named after, uh, learned to become the liaisons between the Roanoke colony settlers and the Indians and had favorable interaction with British colonist John White. In fact, Mantillo was christened and given the name Lord of Roanoke, making him the first American Indian to receive a title of nobility. Uh, the only other significant town on Roanoke Island is Juan Cheese, named after the uh, the other chief. Um, around 1,700 people on the south end of the island. Um, I've never been uh, to the islands, but now I really want to go. Mantillo especially sounds super charming. It was named the seat of Dare County, named after Virginia Dare in 1870 and incorporated in 1899. And when it incorporated, every store lining the waterfront had two doors. How cute is this? One for those coming by boat. And the other for those coming from the courthouse or one of the inns on Walter, or, uh, Water Street. How, uh, how fun. Just boat on up to the general store, boat on up to the courthouse, boat on over to the saloon, and then boat just directly into the dock and then sink your ship and drown. Uh, the island itself has about 7,000 people, has a big aquarium, regional airport, a couple museums, lighthouses, Fort Raleigh, National Historic Site, which preserves the site of the original lost colony of Roanoke. Uh, after the lost colony was, uh, you know, well, lost, American Indians lived apart from European settlers, undisturbed for another 70 years. And then after the island was abandoned by American Indians following a, a war between the uh, Powhatan uh, tribe and the Jamestown colony in 1646, uh, the English drove them out of the area. And then in the late 17th century, early English pioneers settled the island. And it wasn't until uh, Mantilla was founded in 1899 that the community had its first incorporated town. So, so it took a while after that very, very early attempt to, to colonize it to actually, you know, uh, gain an actual town. But you're not far, uh, but, you're, but you're not here, excuse me, for modern Roanoke history. I know that. I know that. You're here to find out what happened to that original colony. And me too. So let's start with the time suck timeline, beginning with the events that led to the first colonization trip and ending with the disappearance of that first colony. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. In 1540, future member of the second Roanoke voyage that established the Lost Colony, grandfather of Virginia Dare, John White, is born. Actually, his date of uh, birth is not known. Historians put it somewhere between 1540 and 1990. He lived to be uh, possibly 450 years old. Look it up if you don't fucking believe me. All right? No, don't do that. That's a, that's a huge waste of time. That's not true. No, he was born somewhere between 1540 and 1550. Uh, he was most likely born in London, as there are records of him attending church in London, the parish of St. Martin Ludgate. There's also a record of him getting married to Thomas and Cooper in London in 1566, uh, with whom he had a son and a daughter. And he would be brought on the initial expedition to Roanoke because he was a talented artist. Centuries later, an expedition would bring a photographer to do what he was asked to do. Today, you would bring a videographer. He was commissioned to draw to life the inhabitants of the New World and their surroundings. He would complete numerous watercolor drawings of the surrounding landscape and native peoples. And these uh, watercolors have thankfully survived. Now you, now you, uh, um, you know, can, can see the sole surviving kind of visual record of American Indians' first contact with English settlers. Do a Google image search if you have time. It's, uh, it's worth it. Very, very cool. Uh, in 1554, English adventurer, writer, favorite uh, courtier of Queen Elizabeth I, man who uh, Raleigh, North Carolina is named after, and leader of the Roanoke voyage, Sir Walter Raleigh is born. Or possibly in 1552. Again, not the best birth records for everybody back then. At age 15, maybe 17, in 1569, he fought with the French Huguenots in the French religious civil wars and then later studied at Oxford in 1572. Between 1579 and 1583, this young dude took part in the uh, suppression of the Desmond Rebellions in Ireland when the Earl of Desmond, head of the Fitzgerald dynasty, rebelled against the Queen of England and then got punished. Uh, in 1580, he took part in the siege of Smerwick during the second Desmond Rebellion with a force of, uh, or with a force, excuse me, of 400 to 600 papal soldiers from Spain and Italy captured the village of Smerwick and were besieged then by the English army. They surrendered and then were massacred. Uh, yes, massacred after they surrendered by, by Sir Walter Raleigh. And Queen Elizabeth was impressed by his ruthlessness. Uh, for his part in the victory, Raleigh received 40,000 acres of Irish land, including two entire towns. He's, uh, he's now doing well for a dude in his 20s. He became a favorite of Queen Elizabeth while serving in her army in Ireland. Uh, and then they met in the spring of 1582. 
and she was smitten. He stood six feet tall, a head taller than most men uh, of the day, and was described as handsome and of a muscular build. He was in his late 20s. She was 49. He was ambitious and loyal to England, and she was a kingless and childless queen who longed for male companionship. He was the ideal companion, and she showered him with gifts. And then once a week, as payment for the riches she uh, bestowed upon him, he was more than happy to lay on her lap and uh, be held like a little baby man and suckle upon her teat. That was their arrangement. It wasn't sexual. Elizabeth just liked to have her breast suckled upon, and it felt like it was wrong to force that on a child, so she would let a man do it. Uh, he wasn't allowed to touch her, wasn't allowed to make eye contact. Uh, he, he, he could adjust the nipple and attempt to get more pretend milk. I guess that was the only way he could touch her. And he had to have a clean-shaven face. And they would do this in front of attendants like it was no big deal. Uh, they even did it one time in front of an emissary from Belgium. Ended up hurting Britain's uh, diplomatic relations with uh, Belgium for decades. And, uh, and these suckling sessions are likely what put William on the fast track to be knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1585 and then two years later becoming captain of the Queen's Guard. And I doubt... Any of you uh, are still following that, still believing that, the uh, the man-baby nipple suckling. Uh, but if you are, God bless you. Uh, no, none of that happened. Uh, other than the being knighted and becoming captain. That part is true. Uh, <laughs> how great, how great, though, the rest of the stuff was true. What a weird footnote in history that would be. Uh, yeah, she was, she was uh, you know, a queen admired by her people. Eccentric. She was eccentric. She did enjoy having a full-grown man suckle upon her teeth. Other than that... Strong leadership qualities. Uh, anyway, Raleigh was an early supporter of North American colonization. And in 1584, Queen Elizabeth, who did really uh, uh, was really smitten with this guy, uh, granted Raleigh a royal charter authorizing him to explore, colonize, and rule any, quote, remote heathen and barbarous lands, countries, and territories not actually possessed of any Christian prince or inhabited by Christian people. <laughs> of course she did. Just a license to kill anyone who isn't like us. Everyone who's not English or at least, you know, Christian, fucking worthy of death. Ruthless. This is pretty much just the way people were back then. At least the ruling class of most nations. You're either one of us or you're less than human. You're a savage. God is on our side and loves us the most. And God wants us to do whatever we need to do to fucking win. So get ready, heathen, because death is coming. Imagine if a leader of a so-called civilized nation did that today. All right, Bill, you want to head across the sea and grab some land and loot for yourself? All right, do it. So there's a few countries I want you to leave alone. But other than that, you do what you need to do. I'll fund it. You have my permission to just uh, fuck up anybody uh, you want to fuck up, especially North Korea. Just go get them. Go on now. Life is a little different uh, back before the concept of war crimes and the Geneva Conventions. Queen Elizabeth chartered Raleigh in exchange for one-fifth of the gold and other treasure he might find. And this charter specified that Raleigh had seven years in which to establish a settlement or else he would lose his right to do so. He had exclusive rights for a settlement for seven years. Raleigh and Elizabeth intended that the venture should provide riches from the New World and a base from which to send privateers on raids against the treasure fleets of Spain. On April 27, 1584, Raleigh dispatched an expedition led by Captain Philip, uh, excuse me, Captain Philip Amadas uh, and Master Arthur Barlow to explore the eastern coast of North America with two ships piloted by veteran Portuguese navigator Simon Fernandez. Uh, Amadas, who commanded the flagship, which may have been Raleigh's 200-ton vessel Bark Raleigh, was a member of Raleigh's official household, where he may have uh, studied instrumental navigation and related mathematics. Barlow, commander of the other vessel, possibly a smaller sailboat named the Dorothy, had become one of Raleigh's servants in Ireland as early as 1580 or 1581. Uh, after sailing through the Canary Islands and the Caribbean, uh, the two ships reached the mainland American coast on July 4th, 1584, exactly 192 years before the colonies would declare independence from Britain. They suffered no hardships and no storms of any note in this journey. Nice omen of things to come on that first expedition. First expedition, every about it is mwah, beauty. Uh, they sailed northward until they reached an entrance or river issuing into the sea. According to a later account by one Richard Butler, they landed first near present-day uh, Oak Ocracoke, Hopefully that's right. I used that fucking North Carolina pronunciation guy for that one. That doesn't look like it's spelled at all to me, but Ocracoke is what they say. Uh, uh, landed uh, near uh, present-day Ocracoke Island, though Barlow's journal suggests an initial landing farther north near present-day Oregon Inlet. Uh, the exact location difficult to determine because of centuries of change in the barrier islands. They shift around quite a bit. And after uh, anchoring, the explorers went ashore in boats to view and take possession of the land next to joining for Queen Elizabeth I and their patron Raleigh. Barlow's journal provides an almost lyrical description of the land and exploration. This is pretty cool, too. If you want to do something further, I mean, it's, it's in the um, the footnotes at the bottom of the uh, script, which you can find on the app, the, the notes on the PDF download. 
But uh, online, there's there's uh, several just free copies of Barlow's or- original journal entries talking about his, you know basically like, well not basically it's the it's the first time somebody from England is seeing what is now the United States and describing what they're seeing. Uh, here's the journal entry about Barlow seeing the North American continent for the very first time. First time, you know, someone someone who's British would ever lay eyes on the land that would become the U.S. It's a struggle. If it's, it's, it seems like it's a struggle at times to read, is because it is not written in today's English. A lot of weird spellings, but I'm gonna do my best. He said, "The fourth of the same month, we arrived upon the coast, which we are supposed to be a continent and firm land, and we sailed along the same 120 English miles before we could find any entrance or river issuing into the sea." The first that appeared unto us we entered, though not without some difficulty, and cast anchor about three harquebus shot within the haven's mouth on the left hand of the same. And after thanksgiving to God for our safe arrival thither, we manned our boats, and we went to view the land next to joining, and to take possession of the same. And in the right of the Queen's most excellent majesty, and rightful Queen, and Princess of the same, and after delivered to the same, to your use, according to Her Majesty's grant, and let us patents under Her Highness Great Seal, which being performed according to the ceremonies used in such enterprises, we viewed the land about us, being whereas we first landed, very sandy and low towards the water's side, but so full of grapes, as the very beating and surge of the sea overflowed them, of which we found such plenty, as well there as in all places else, both on the sand and on the green soil on the hills, as in the plains, as well on every little shrub, as also climbing towards the tops of high cedars, that I think in all the world the like abundance is not to be found. And myself, having seen those parts of Europe that most abound, first such difference as were incredible to be written." Uh, I love how I love how thick the kiss ass laid it, uh, this, or the kiss assery went on when he's talking about the queen. Man, he just really just puckered up there. Just the queen's most excellent Majesty, the rightful queen, and also the princess, God's finest work, if I may be so bold. More angel than woman, the object of every man's desire. But of course, in a most respectful, not at all lustful way. But if one were to lust. They would certainly lust more for the queen than any other woman in history. The holiest of holies, the greatest of minds, the bravest of warriors, noblest of royals, the uh, the um, the best dancer of the of the court, the, the teller of the funniest jokes, the songbird of her generation, most excellent uh, kite flyer, very good at flying kite, the baker of the finest bunt cakes. If if the queen deemed bunt cake baking worthy of a delicate yet Powerful angel hands. That's quite enough, Arthur. Yes, your, yes, your highness. I'm, I'm sure that's just what you had to do, right? You know, you got to kiss the queen's ass or your career, if not your life, is over. Uh, it's so funny to me. Later, Barlow wrote uh, of the first ever encounter between English colonists and American Indians living in present-day United States. He wrote, uh, We remained on the side of this island two whole days before we saw any people of the country. The third day, we spied small boats rowing towards us, having it three persons. This boat came to the island side. Four harquebus shot from our ships, and the two of the people remaining. The third came along the shore side towards us, and we being then all within board, he walked up and down upon the point of land next unto us. Then the master and the pilot of the admiral, Simon Fernando, and the captain, Philip Amadas, myself and others rode to the land, whose coming this fellow attended, never making any show of fear or doubt. And after he had spoken of many things not understood by us, we brought him, with his own good liking, aboard the ships, and gave him a shirt, a hat, and some other things, and made him taste of our wine and our meat, which he liked very well. And after having viewed both par- parks, he departed and, and went to his own boat again, with which he had left in a little cove or creek adjoining. As soon as he was two bow shoot in the water, he fell to fishing, and in less than half an hour... He had laden his boat as deep as it could swim, with which he came again to the point of the land, and there he divided his fish into two parts, pointing one part to the ship and the other to the pinnace, which after he had as much as might requited the former benefits received, departed out of our sight. They put lots of fucking weird E's in this. I have to pause in seconds, because like every word has an extra E at the end. Like boat is B-O-A-T-E, deep is D-E-E-P-E, swim, they throw an extra M in it, it's S-W-I-M-M-E. I want to. I want to read it like his boaty as deepy as he could swimmy, with which he e came again e to the pointy of the landy. Uh, anyway, so sad that things started off so peacefully between English and American Indians. Man, sharing of food, giving of gifts. 
And then for the Indians, it ended so badly, as we were reminded last week with Andrew Jackson, right? To the victor goes to the spoils, huh? And so often to the losers of war comes nothing but pain and sorrow. Man, what's the oldest of cliches? Just what, life's not fair? Man, it sure isn't. Sometimes despite your best efforts, you just end up on the wrong side of history. Uh, anyways, uh, Barlow also wrote of the invitation from a tribal king, uh, Gran Ganimo. I couldn't find a pronunciation for this fucker. Uh, Gran Ganimo. I don't know. It's a tough word. Uh, Gran, Gran Ganimo. It's no disrespect. I just, I don't know. It's tricky. Uh, name for the, the, he used to visit the island of Roanoke with this guy. This is the, this is the chief, uh, this is the tribal king of Roanoke, uh, which was named, of course, for the, for the tribe of, you know, American Indians called the Roanoke living there. And he writes, and the evening following, we came to an island, which they call Roanoke, distant from the harbor by which we entered seven leagues. And at the north end thereof was a village of nine houses built of cedar and fortified round about with sharp trees to keep out their enemies. And the entrance into it made like a turnpike, very artificially. When we came towards it, standing near unto the water's side, the wife of Gran Ganimo, the king's brother, came running out to meet us very cheerfully and friendly. Her husband was not then in the village. Some of her people she commanded to draw a boat onto shore for the beating of the billow. I don't know. Uh, others she appointed to carry us on their backs to the dry ground. All right, a little fucking piggyback ride up to the beach. That's service. And uh, others to bring our oars into the house of Ophir stealing. When we came into the utter room, five in five rooms in the house, she caused us to sit down by a great fire. And after took off our clothes and washed them and dried them again, some of the women plucked off our stockings and washed them. Some washed our feet in warm water. And she herself took great pains to see all things ordered in the best manner she could, making great haste to dress some meat for us to eat. After we had thus dried ourselves, she brought us into the inner room, where she sat on the board standing along the house some wheat, sodden, sodden venison, roasted fish sodden, boiled and roasted melons raw and sodden, roots of divers, kinds and divers, fruits. I swear to God, this is what he writes. Roots of divers, kinds and divers, fruits. Uh, their drink is commonly water, but while the grape lasteth, they drinketh wine, and for their want of cast to keep it, yet... Or all the year after they drink water. Oh, because they, they can't store the wine. But it is sodden with ginger in it and black cinnamon and sometimes sassafras and divers other wholesome and medicinal herbs and trees. <laughs> uh, put some tree in it, apparently. We entertained with all love and kindness and with much bounty after their manner as they could possibly devise. We found the people most gentle, loving, and faithful, void of all guile and treason, and such live as the manner of the golden age. Man, again, started off so well. Chief Gran, Gran Guimo, quite the host. Uh, his wife, quite the hostess, man, just whining and dining. These explorers, they're just fucking peaceful, no guile, gentle and loving, washing their clothes, getting them piggyback rides on the beach, probably just high-fiving each other. So much fun. Oh, man, it started off so well. Then after taking more time to survey the land around Roanoke and learn more about the tribe living there, uh, expedition leaders Arthur Barlow and Philip uh, Amatis convinced two local chiefs Montillo and Wanchis to accompany them back to London where they will report to Sir Walter Raleigh and tell him about how suitable they think the land they have found is for colonization. Right, this is just an exploratory trip. They leave two unnamed crew members behind with the tribes uh, as insurance for taking two of their men and somehow convey that uh, to the tribes that they will bring them back. I don't, know, I don't know how you do that. How do you communicate to a new civilization where no one on earth who speaks your language also speaks their language? Hard to even get my head around that. Uh, November of 1584, Raleigh's crew, minus the two they left behind, uh, make it back to London and report to Raleigh. A crew member, Thomas Harriet, a noted English mathematician, astronomer, and translator, uh, he'd been learning the Algonquin uh, language from Mantillo and Chief Wanchis on the return voyage, and regaled Raleigh uh, with tales of a great city called Skikok uh, and reports of vast amounts of gold and silver inland from Roanoke. Uh, both Chief uh, Mon uh, Mantillo and Chief Wanchis were housed at Raleigh's London residence, Durham House. Uh, Mantillo befriended his, befriended his host and learned English, while Wanchis uh, became more and more suspicious of his hosts and soon considered himself a captive of the English. By Christmas of 1584, Harriet uh, had become virtually fluent in Algonquin and gathered tons of intelligence for the next journey. Uh, Raleigh's impressed with the information Harry provides and believes there is a great deal to, uh, of money to be made, a great deal of fortune to be made in Roanoke and in the inland uh, areas beyond Roanoke. So with the Queen's permission, he charters a return voyage to Roanoke in the hopes of making a fortune and expanding the Queen's empire and riches through, you know, colonization. And speaking of the Queen, I would like to take a moment to talk about today's sponsor. Today's Time Suck is brought to you by Queen Lizzie's Suckle Shack. 
You ever notice how happy a baby is when it's suckling milk off one of mama's sweet teats? The happiest it could possibly be. The happiest a human being has ever been. So why do we decide to cut that happiness off in early childhood? Well, now you don't have to. At Queen Lizzie's Suckle Shack, we have all kinds of teats for you to suckle on until you're ready to nod off with a full belly and a contented soul. Small teats, big teats, pink teats, brown teats, B teats, D teats, even G and H. Mama can toss them over her shoulder when they're dry teats. Queen Lizzie's Suckle Shack has professional wet nurses with nipples strong enough to handle both an adult appetite and adult teeth. Make either a 15-minute snack appointment, an hour-long full meal appointment, a Lumberjack's Appetite 3 Mamas slash 6 Teats treat, or a 12-hour meal nap snack, and then two burping sessions with an in-house Icelandic powerlifter appointment. At Queen Lizzie's Suckle Shack, you decide when the suckling stops. To get your first teat for free, please go to queenlizziesuckleshack.warmmilk slash teats for 20% off your first nipple. And... I'm done. Who's still listening? Half my audience? 10%? Should I tell Joe Paisley and Lindsay that the run is over and they need to find new jobs? Okay. Well, that was fun for me at least. Now, back to England in the 1580s. Sir Walter Raleigh <laughs> convincing Queen Elizabeth has nothing to do, she had nothing to do with a suckle shack to allow him to attempt to colonize present-day North Carolina. Why would she even want to do that? Well, she wanted to because England was in a tough spot in the 1580s. Spain was making a fortune with gold being plundered from South and Central America. We learned all about that in the Aztec suck. France was also powerful and getting more powerful with early colonial efforts. Irish rebellions against British rule were becoming more and more frequent and costly to suppress. In Scotland, pro-English regent James Douglas had recently been overthrown. And Queen Elizabeth, worried about young Scottish king James VI, who would become future king James I of England, worried about him falling under Catholic influence and breaking away from England. So, you know, it feels like things are falling apart. It feels like she's being threatened from all sides. In order to keep England from being swallowed up by a rival colonial power or from within, in order to keep hold of her kingdom, she's got to do something. And colonizing what is now the United States was that something she decided to do. So in December of 1584, Queen Elizabeth approves for Raleigh to establish a large harbor on Roanoke Island from which English privateers could harass Spanish shipping in the Caribbean and Western Atlantic, establish a long-term English presence in the New World that would in time fatally undermine Spain's empire. Uh, I do love how pirating, uh, you know, rival country ships was part of kind of colonial power strategy, you know, which was a good strategy. Like we, we learned that way back in Suck 28, the Blackbeard Suck, that a lot of these privateers uh, what actually then eventually transitioned into becoming full-on pirates, you know, realizing, why am I risking my life stealing gold from Spanish ships and then giving it to the queen when I can just keep it myself? You know, I'm the one taking it. But but I love how, like, these pirates, many of them were just created in these political situations where, you know, how do we keep Spain from getting more powerful? Well, we, we get this little island over here. We have to get a little harbor built, and uh, we have some guys hanging out with ships over there. And then uh, when the Spanish and the, and the shipping routes, you know, they just sneak over and just fuck their ships up, take all their stuff and bring it to us instead. Let them do all the work. Go down and, you know, get it. Actually, you know, the mines or somebody, they're going to do all the work. But then let the Spanish bring it back until they get it almost here around the Canary Islands or somewhere. And then we just pop in and take it. Uh, January 6, 1585, Queen Elizabeth, as I mentioned earlier, knights William Raleigh, names him Duke of Virginia. Uh, they're calling Roanoke uh, Virginia at this point, although it will actually become part of North Carolina. Their name, Virginia, by the way, is taken from Queen Elizabeth uh, being known as the Virgin Queen. Virginia coming, of course, from the word virgin. And, and I do think that's a lot better choice than the other name they were considering for Virginia, which was Desert Pussy. Uh, as in vagina. <laughs> as in vagina that rarely receives any moisture. Sorry, not sorry. When the term Desert Pussy popped into my sometimes stuck in junior high brain, I just felt compelled to share it with you. So, Sir Raleigh begins to prepare his men to establish Roanoke. Queen Elizabeth donates one of her ships, Tiger, for the journey. Raleigh buys four ships and has two uh, pinnace or small boats made. A pinnace was a good for going from uh, like the place where you would anchor your larger vessel to the shore. It could be either sailed or rowed. Raleigh wanted to lead the party himself, but his request was denied by Elizabeth. She wanted to keep her young man meat close. He needed to keep his lips on our sweet teats. No sailing for you, Walt. Just suck a little mama's sweet teats. I don't want you. Come on, don't be a brat, Walt. Put my nipple in your mouth. I don't like being called Walt. I'm Walt, sir. I'm a grown man. You're not my mother. Well, you're just tired, Walt. You're just tired. You just need a nap. You'll get one. Just drink mama's milk first. 
Ah, uh, I don't know what's wrong with me today. Unable to go himself, Raleigh chooses Sir Richard Grenville, 42-year-old, highly decorated sea captain, veteran of numerous naval battles to lead the colonization voyage. The first colonization expedition, the previous trip being uh, just exploratory, was composed of five ships and two pinnaces uh, and would uh, consist of 600 men. That's such a weird word, pinnaces, by the way. Uh, it sounds so much like penises. Uh, they took five ships and two wings. Uh, no, but two pinnaces. Uh, it was led by Granville along with Colonel Ralph Lane and Philip uh, Amatis, who was chosen as Admiral of Virginia and put in charge of defense. Arthur Barlow also returned. Simon Fernandez, once again chief pilot. John White, John White Thomas Harriet, chosen to uh, survey the land. They're back. Uh, they were meant to be aided by Chief Mantillo, Chief Wanchis. No women and families allowed in this mission. One Anglican minister sent along to spread Christianity to the natives. Raleigh's strategy was to send Granville with the first wave of colonists to Roanoke Island to establish a beachhead. Shortly after, Bernard Drake and uh, Amias Preston, two experienced mariners, were to follow with a second group of about 200 men to strengthen their position. Right? So that's the plan. You send this first wave over first, and a couple months later, then you send this second wave to strengthen the position. And then further supplies and settlers are sent over in more and more waves as the colony grows. That's the plan. Uh, you're going to see how that doesn't work out. In the meantime, Granville was to conduct a reconnaissance of the Outer Banks, establish initial settlement, and then depend on circumstance, you know, uh, either stay with the colony or zip back to England. And how exciting would it be, by the way, to be in charge of colonizing something? I mean, seriously. You get to build a new civilization in a land your people have barely or never even been. That, to me, more exciting than just exploration. Like, like we're, I, th- I feel like we're hardwired to want to create and then take pride in our creations. Like, like when I make an album or even uh, when I create an episode of this podcast, I think, that's cool, man. I, I made that. I created that. It feels good. Uh, and it feels even better, at least to me, when you do something with your hands. It's tangible. Like a couple years ago, I made uh, my kids a tree fort, big one. When I was done, I just felt an enormous sense of pride. You know, like, like more than with the album. The, the, the tree fort is tangible. I could touch it, walk around on it, sit on the deck. I made it, sit under its roof, be protected from the elements. I built that. I can only imagine what it would be like to fund an expedition to a new territory, fund the building of like a a whole new town and a whole new land. How cool for the initial settlers as well. Like you show up, there's just woods. No one speaks your language if there's even anyone else around at all. Then you just start cutting down trees, building homes with your hands, rudimentary tools, stores, forts, a church, have roads built, fields plowed, crops planted, harbor built. How incredible if you're the one who chartered the colony also uh, to then come over and just see this brand new shiny town in the woods. Uh, Not that any of that would be the fate of Roanoke. On April 9th, 1585, the group sets sail from England, uh, and the seas are rough almost immediately, and they lose one pinnace in the first week, and then all the other ships are scattered in the storm and lose sight of each other. Uh, All of this, bad omen, bad sign of things to come. This trip is fittingly starting off uh, the opposite of that peaceful initial exploratory trip. It's stormy and terrible, and things are only going to get worse. Grenville arrived in the lead ship, Tiger, in Puerto Rico. On May 11th, uh, the ship Elizabeth made it on May 19th. Grenville decided to continue on without the other ships. He captured a small Spanish trade ship and route, which he plundered and then took to his fleet. On June 29th, 1585, they reached the Outer Banks, but Tiger ends up getting caught on a sandbank. Stuck for over two hours. This trip is cursed. Uh, the ship sustains major damage. Much of the food stores they needed to live on are ruined. And on July 11th, 1585, Grenville makes it to Roanoke Island and is delighted to discover that two of the ships in his fleet he was parted from in the stormy seas that began their journey, Roebuck and Dorothy, had beat him there. And then they all spent a week exploring the area and visiting various uh, Secotan, or Secotan, Secotan, I couldn't find a pronunciation for that, sorry. I looked, I looked, uh, Secotan, probably Secotan, uh, various Secotan settlements. The Secotans were a group of American Indians whose tribes included Roanoke. Uh, on July 21st, Chief uh, whew, Chief Grand Jamio uh, of Roanoke gave Grenville permission to make his settlement on the north end of Roanoke Island. Things looking up at the moment. And then over the next few weeks, you know, they built a small fort that was about 120 by 100 yards, large enough to accommodate the 160 men of the Tiger. That seems tiny to me. Well, I guess yards. But man, 160 dudes sleeping in a little fort. I just, I just can't, I just can't picture how they would do it. Like I. All cramped and tiny their sleeping quarters must have been. You know, they weren't sleeping on memory foam, that's for sure. They weren't sleeping on fucking Lisa mattresses. No mattresses. I imagine they just slept on the floor, maybe maybe on a mat of some kind at best, some humid room. No bug screen? How did they do it? How did they live back then? Uh, while they were busy building the settlement, Grenville dispatched men in the surrounding area to look for gold and silver. So far, he had been very disappointed with the lack of apparent wealth of the natives. 
Uh, then on August 25th, Granville is planned, departs for England on the repaired Tiger. He leaves 100 men to work the settlement. Uh, he assumed the second wave was still on their way. Uh, but unfortunately, Queen Elizabeth had repurposed those men to fight the Spanish. Now, this is a bummer. This is when shit really starts to go south for those early colonists. Uh, yet another example of the problems with old-time communication. Uh, how much does this suck for the first wave of dudes? They've prepared for months. They've signed on to a plan that included a second wave of reinforcements to help them fortify their position, bring more food, help farm the new land, help them prepare for winter, help them defend themselves from potential hostile armies if need be. And then after they're already over there, after they've done their part of the mission, they get abandoned half a world away. Like, what if we did that with some Mars colonization mission? You know, just send a first wave of people to Mars with the understanding that, you know, second wave's coming to help uh, finish building the space base. You need to live uh, more food so you don't die. And then after they're already working on Mars, you know, they just get a message like, hey, sorry, everybody. I know this is uh, disappointing uh, for you, but uh, look, you're probably going to die up there now because we had some shit come up. It was more important for us to deal with back home, and we're, we're not ugh, we're not going to send any more people. So uh, best luck. Toodles. Uh, Colonel Ralph Lane was left in charge of the settlement. Initially, Lane was loving it before he found out the reinforcements weren't coming. Initially, he'd written back to England about how amazing this new territory was, stating that uh, Roanoke Island was most pleasing territory of the world, for the soil is of a huge unknown greatness, and very well people, uh, and the climate so wholesome that we have not had one sick since we touched land here. To conclude, if Virginia had but horse and kind in some reasonable proportion, I dare assure myself being inhabited with English, no realm in Christendom were comparable to it. I, th I think that was way of his, uh, his way of saying it's, it's pretty cool. On the way back to England, Granville attacked and looted a Spanish ship and plundered 40,000 Spanish ducats and about 80,000 ducats worth of ivory, ginger, and some other stuff. The English took uh, this as a good omen for building these American colonies. Uh, the Tiger lands back in England, and John White immediately finds Raleigh to report back on everything. By early November 1585, Lane and the men on Roanoke, now they realize the second wave of people are just not coming. At least not when they were supposed to. Not cool. His men grow restless and irritable, so Lane organizes an expedition up to Chesapeake Bay. They also planned this expedition because, well, relations with the local Sakotans rapidly deteriorating. Mostly because the English had brought with them a lot of diseases like smallpox and influenza that the Indians had no natural immunity uh, for. And these viruses are just wreaking havoc. They're sweeping through villages, killing lots of people. Just, uh, whoops, sorry. Sorry about that, everybody. We did not, oh, man. Oh, we did not plan on this. We didn't expect this. I, listen, I know you're upset that a lot of your people are dead. And I listen, I get it. But you have to understand that we don't know much about medicine. Uh, we could not have predicted this. I would take it back if I could. I would go back and cough into the crook of my elbow and not directly into your faces if I could. Uh, some Sacatone elders start thinking that the English are actually dead men who would returned to the world and were immortal. They prophesied that more English were coming to kill them and take their places, which actually is pretty accurate. Uh, others believe the trail of death left by the colonists was not caused by disease, but by invisible bullets. Mm-hmm. You and your tricky invisible bullets. They thought the invisible bullets were being fired by soldiers from many miles away to punish the local tribes for somehow insulting them. Uh, the Sakotan chief decides the English are dangerous. He makes it clear he wants them to get the fuck out. You take your invisible bullets and you go and go, get out of here. Go on, get. And then uh, the American Indian hosts, you know, start attacking them. And, uh, and they were also attacked by uh, some of the colonists uh, over, I'm sure, a lot of uh, nonsense and miscommunication. There's also, you know, a, a lot of different tribes and, you know, and some of the tribes not friendly with one another. So it's, you know, it just starts getting a little rough. Start running into more host hostile kind of situations. The honeymoon is over. Uh, on June 8th of 1586, a fleet of ships led by Sir Francis Drake makes it to Roanoke. Drake had been dispatched to fight the Spanish near Florida but wasn't doing well. And after reporting back to the queen, he was ordered to send reinforcements to Raleigh's colony. So they didn't get that, you know— that one group coming back over to reinforce him, but now now Drake shows up. So they get something. Uh, but it's not good. He has three large ships, offers any assistance Lane needs, but just as they been, uh, start making their preparations, a hurricane strikes and damages the boats. Just shit. Nothing's going well. June 18th, Drake fits the colonists on his ships. They all sell, uh, set sail back to England. He doesn't have enough provisions after that uh, storm to uh, allow them to stay there. So they all sail back, other than a small garrison of like 15 unlucky bastards who stay back in the Fort Grenville had built. Uh, and so just a year after landing, they, head back, they, they, they take off, they head back. During that first year, there was no discovery of wealth, very little progress in developing a harbor for Queen Elizabeth to launch attacks against the Spanish. This colonization effort so far, just pretty much a total failure. Uh, Raleigh's pissed uh, when he finds out. Drake was supposed to reinforce the colony, not evacuate it. He'd sent a supply ship in July. <laughs> he did send one. He just sent it way late that landed after Drake had left. How much does that suck? 
So everybody takes off, and then the supply ship's like, hey, guys, we're here. Oh, hey, where is everybody? Yeah, Grenville arrives less than a month later with six ships carrying 200 new colonists, baffled to find no sign of Lane's men or supply ship, uh, which had returned to England. So then he, he just brings everybody back. The whole experiment, just, just one disaster after another now. Lane explains to Raleigh that the river system and harbor are ill-suited to large ships. Natives are now enemies. There was not any treasure to be found, nothing but bad news. He tries to convince Raleigh that they needed to move where they wanted to build a colony. But while Lane is telling Raleigh about how unsuitable Roanoke is for colonization, Thomas Harriet is trying to convince Raleigh of the exact opposite, that there's plenty of valuable resources uh, in Roanoke Island, and it should be where they head back to. Uh, he said the English had found silk grass, like that grown in Persia, which could be cultivated to great profit because of the demand in England and abroad. They discovered silkworms, as large as walnuts, introduced mulberry trees. They would be able to develop a trade as great uh, that, that prompted by the Persians, Turks, Spanish, and Italians. There were all kinds of trees that could be used to produce pitch, tar, turpentine, cedar for furniture, other timber products, sugar cane, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and in the spring of 1586, Raleigh decides that he will attempt a colony one more time, but he's not going to do it in Roanoke. He's going to set his harbor at Chesapeake Bay. Uh, he decides that that first colony failed due not only to location, but also to the caliber of the colonists. Lane described the soldiers he had commanded as wild men, unruly and difficult to control, just riffraff. That's why the first colony didn't take fucking riffraff. You can't start a colony with riffraff. Listen, you can't start off with a trailer park. I mean, sure, a trailer park is going to eventually show up, but you don't lead with it. You start with the cream of the crop. Uh, Harriet criticized them for being too aggressive and quick to resort to violence. Uh, he said his men killed the local people. He wrote, uh, you know, basically over some, some bullshit. Many of the men had been unsuited to the hardships of life in a fledgling colony. So Raleigh therefore decided that the new colony would be a civilian settlement rather than another military garrison made up of men and women committed to the venture who had an interest, vested interest in its outcome. Uh, to encourage settlers to join the enterprise uh, for this next attempt, he grants each individual 500 acres and families proportionally more a huge amount of land by the standards of the day. It was then up to White and Grenville to recruit new settlers. And recruit they did. They recruited a group of young, ambitious families looking for opportunities they'd never find in England because they didn't have the money or the right family name to climb the social ladder there. It was a young group with White and Fernandez in their 40s, everyone else in their mid-20s to early 30s. White's daughter, Elizabeth Dare, mother of the yet-to-be-born Virginia Dare, and her husband, uh, Ananias, agreed to relocate to the colony. Raleigh gave three ships for the crossing, the Lion, 120 tons, which would carry White, Fernandez, about 50 settlers, an unnamed flyboat, about 100 tons, commanded by Edward Spicer, who would carry 50 settlers in their cargo, and, uh, and a pinnace, a little 30-ton pinnace, commanded by Captain Edward Stafford, who had been a member of Lane's colony, and this ship had room for about 20 more settlers. All, all in all, three ships, 150 people. The plan was for the uh, group to stop on Roanoke Island for White uh, to return two natives uh, to Wai'i, and uh, Mantillo, Mantillo had returned for a second trip to England to their people. And then the colonists were to move on to Chesapeake Bay, find a site for the main colony, and begin settling, uh, building their settlement. At that point, Fernandez and Spicer would go back to England to inform Raleigh of the colony's safe arrival, leaving the pinnace behind for settlers' use. White probably anticipated that Raleigh had uh, heard the colony had been uh, established. He would, he would fit out another expedition to reinforce the colony as soon as possible. And then in April of 1587, the expedition is ready to set sail. And then at the last minute, two dozen settlers back out making the best choice of their lives. Then on May 8th, 1587, the fleet anchors in Plymouth and will head to Virginia in a few days. And then on June 22nd, 1587, the fleet lands in the St. Croix Islands, will rest there for a few days, and, uh, and they have a disaster there. Eager for fresh fruit, they find some small fruits, look like green apples, but they turn out to be poisonous, and they burn their mouths, actually, quote, burn their mouths and tongues so badly they could not speak. Many of the settlers also became sick from drinking contaminated water from a stagnant pond near the temporary shelters they constructed soon after landing. Even washing themselves in the water caused their face to burn and swell so that they were unable to see for nearly a week. <laughs> Jesus. Omens for this trip even worse than the last trip. Think about that. Everything goes smoothly on the exploratory trip. right? No bad weather, plenty of food, friendly indigenous people showering them with gifts. Then on the second trip, massive storm at the start of the voyage scatters the ships. Then supplies are damaged and lost. Then the friendly natives turn on them, or probably more accurately, you know, they do a bunch of shit to the locals uh, to make the locals hate them and want them to get out. And they have to sail back. And now they're starting off their trip getting sick from eating poison apples, drinking some new beverage from the people behind McGill's Pop, some new melt and swell your face or burn your eyes out water. They should have probably turned around at this point. On July 22nd, 1587, White and his men land on Roanoke Island 
at the place po- possibly near Shallowback Bay uh, where the small garrison of 15 men had been left a year earlier and there was no one there. Only the bleached bones of one of the men who White supposed had been killed by the Indians long before. This is a really bad sign. Not good to just find the bones of the men who, who you left behind in the fort or that you left behind in the fort when you show up to start the, the colony. On July 25th, a flyboat arrives with 118 settlers. Only two had deserted the mission in Puerto Rico shortly after that whole poison apple firewater debacle. Uh, they spent the next few weeks building houses. The plan was to build a temporary settlement and then to make it to Chesapeake Bay by the next spring at the latest. Then on July 28th, more really bad news. A settler named George Howe uh, went to a creek near the settlement, stripped off all his clothes to, to catch some crabs, do some crabbing. But hidden in the trees nearby was a group of Sakotan warriors. They were still angry after the epidemic spread from the last failed colony. They're still mad about those invisible bullets. And, uh, and they shoot Howe with 16 arrows and then beat him with clubs until he was just a bloody pulp. Well, I'll teach him. I'll teach him to shoot those invisible bullets. White and the other settlers are shocked. White was not prepared for how much the relationships had deteriorated. He wanted to find out who had killed Howe so he could send Captain Edward Stafford along with Mantillo to visit the Croatoan to see if they could discover what happened. Well, the Crotons uh, explained with Stafford and Mantillo that what had happened with the last colony, uh, you know, th- th- how, how bad the relationships had gotten, about all the disease and the dying and fighting. Uh, they explained also that the missing garrison of those 15 men were attacked by Sakotans last year from a nearby Algonquin village of uh, Dasamongpuk. And then Lane and his men had also uh, killed uh, members of the Croatoan tribe. Stafford and Mantillo tell the chief and elders they want to fix the past wrongs and they want to just start a new relationship. So Stafford informs the elders that if the Sakotans would accept the settlers' friendship, they would in turn willingly receive them again like all is forgiven. And he gives them a week to decide if they want to do that. Have a truce and start over and have peace. Gives them a week to you know send over the message saying, yep, we agree, peace is good, we're starting over. Well, the week passes with no words from the chiefs on the mainland or the Croatoan about a meeting. So White concludes reluctantly that there's no other option than to launch a raid and attack that Dasamongpuk village. So on August 9th, White, Stafford, Mantillo, and two dozen men cross over to the mainland in the middle of the night. They launch their attack against a group of men who are sitting around a fire. They were determined to revenge their evil doings towards us, but White made a big mistake. They had not attacked the Sakotan, but rather they attacked the friendly Croatoan. Whoops! Wrong tribe! They actually attacked Mantillo's tribe instead. Wrong American Indians. Mantillo, understandably, pretty upset uh, that they were attacking his own people. But he somehow gets over it and ultimately sides with White. But man, what the fuck? How did he not know that he was attacking his own people? This is the problem with nighttime attacks in the days before night vision goggles or even flashlights. Really hard to figure out who the hell you were atta- attacking. Uh, big whoops here. Huge whoops. Now you have another tribe very, very upset with you and rightfully so. Well, August uh, 13th, 1587, White holds a ceremony where Mantillo is christened and given the title of Lord of Roanoke and, uh, and uh, Dasamongpuk by right of Raleigh's claim to Virginia and Queen Elizabeth's authority. You know, this, uh, this fit in with the plan that White and settlers would continue on to Chesapeake and Mantillo and his people would hold down Roanoke Island. Mantillo, the first native to be accepted into the Church of England on American soil. Uh, I feel like this was probably a little bit of an apology as well. Just say, hey, buddy. Sorry about the uh, not planning that attack very well, which, uh, you know, the one that ended up killing a lot of your people. Extra sorry for bringing you along for the attack where, where you actually ended up killing a lot of your uh, lot of your people. Super so- super sorry. Hey, how about we make it up to you? Uh, how about we make you one of our chiefs? We make you lord. And we'll give you a ticket to heaven, too. Oh, is it good? Does that sound good? All better? Uh, August 18th, 1587, Elizabeth Dare, White's daughter, gives birth to Virginia Dare. That first Christian, first English settler born in what would become the United States. She's christened on August 24th. By the end of August, uh, the big ship, the Lion, preparing to return to England for the winter. One colonist was supposed to return with Fernandez to give updates to Raleigh. Uh, The main update being like, hey, we didn't have time to plant crops, and uh, we're going to starve to death unless you uh, bring back some supplies soon. Uh, They were supposed to send back uh, Christopher Cooper, but the settlers came to White, to John White as a collective, and implored that he be the one to go as he had the best relationship with Raleigh and would have the best odds of getting him to quickly send more supplies back. And so on August 26th, White makes the decision that he would be the one to return to England. He selects Roger Bailey and Anias uh, Dare to take charge of the settlers while he was away and to continue to prepare them for the move up to Chesapeake Bay. White and the settlers agreed that most of the settlers would move into the mainland for winter. They would only leave a small contingent on Roanoke Island so that they would receive supplies from the West Indies to help White locate the rest of the settlement when he returned in the spring. Finally, White and his assistants make arrangements in case of emergency. If the settlers had to leave the island 
or they're in the settlement in a hurry, they would carve the name of where they were going to in a prominent tree or someplace it was easy to find. A cross over the letters would signify that they had been attacked and forced to depart. So interesting uh, little note here considering what we know about uh, people finding that carved uh, Croatoan you know, later. Uh, on August, uh, carved word, crow tone later. On August 27th, White sails, uh, sails for England with Fernandez and the crew of the line and Captain Spicer and the flyboat, leaving his daughter and new granddaughter behind. When they reached the West Indies, Fernandez and the line stayed to troll the water for prizes. Spicer and White made way for England immediately in the flyboat, and then they had terrible weather during the journey, did not reach Ireland until October 16th, and by that time, they were completely out of supplies. Five sailors out of their 15-person crew had died. Spicer, too sick to carry on, he stays in Ireland to recover while White takes passage aboard a ship headed to Southampton called the Monkey on November 1st. So again... After that first amazing exploratory visit, almost nothing is going right with these expeditions now. Uh, White makes it to London on November 8th. He learns that the line had already docked weeks before. Uh, Fernandez had failed to capture any prizes. White would then have to wait over a week to see Raleigh because the shitstorm he and the settlers he'd convinced to head to Roanoke was continually worsening. Uh, He had landed in London at a terrible time. England was preparing for an invasion. Spain was preparing for an attack. In early October, therefore, the Privy Council, Queen Elizabeth's uh, body of advisors, had ordered a general stay of English shipping, which prohibited all ships from leaving port without permission because they might be needed to defend England's shore. So fuck. Raleigh had been appointed by uh, Queen Elizabeth to uh, be on her council of war, and he had bigger fish to fry than his colonial experiment. Well, on November 20th, nearly three months after leaving Roanoke, White and Raleigh meet, and Raleigh tells White that he will send out a relief boat. Don't worry. I'm sending out a relief boat with, with provisions and men just as soon as I can. Should happen real soon. You know, he's, I've already talked to Captain Edward Stafford uh, aboard the line. You know, I already talked to, to Granville, telling him to start preparing his men. Bulk of his fleet. We're going to get you. And White is initially relieved, but then his anxiety worsens greatly when months go by without another word from Raleigh on when this is going to happen. How terrible does White feel now? How frustrated and helpless. His daughter and granddaughter are across the Atlantic, surrounded by indigenous people they have pissed off. You know, people the colonists have already battled. He knows there's a good chance, you know, that this uh, greatly outnumbered little colony could be under attack or have been attacked already by now. They could be starving. You know, they got there too late to plant crops for winter, and there's not a damn thing he can do about it. You know, all his pleas are falling on deaf ears. There's just other shit going on that's not allowing a boat to go back and help these people. Finally, in March of 1588, uh, Grenville and his fleet do prepare to depart. Just, you know, yay, supplies, finally going to arrive in Roanoke. A few months late, but hey, hopefully not too late. Hopefully peace with local tribes have been attained. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're all the best of friends again. Just woohoo! But then Grenville is given notice from the Privy Council to cancel the trip. Damn it. Grenville told that all of his ships would need to be sent to Plymouth to join Sir Francis Drake, where they would become part of the Queen Navy's, uh, the Queen's Navy in the preparations for this uh, big battle coming up against the Spanish Armada. So, damn it, still no supplies come, and the Roanoke colony has been abandoned for the moment. Uh, April 22nd, 1588, Raleigh able to retain two small ships to send to Roanoke, the Brave, 30 tons, captained by Arthur Facey, and the Roe, a 25-ton pinnace. Uh, not required by Drake. Fifteen settlers are aboard, seven women, four men, four children, as well as supplies. And then this ship leaves for uh, April uh, on April 22nd, excuse me, uh, 1588, yeah, to go to Roanoke. So, you know, rescue mission back on. Yay. Awesome. Unfortunately, Facey actually showed no real interest in making it to the colony. Instead, uh, he went out of his way to attack and plunder any ship that he came across uh, on the sea. His rampage ended only when the Brave was attacked by a a well-armed privateers out of La Rochelle. The larger of the two French ships carried 100 men and 10 cannon and was faster than the English vessel. Facey had little choice but to surrender or fight. He chose to fight and signal his intention by sending a volley of shot into the French ship at close range. The attack set off a fierce battle that lasted for an hour and a half, during which 23 men on both sides were killed or wounded. And then once the English lost the fight, the French plundered the ship, took everything that he could carry, face the order to abandon the journey and return to England. So rescue attempt over. So that sucks. You know, he gets everything together. They do head out. And then, you know, when the captain of the ship he's on wants to make a little extra money, it backfires and he gets his ass kicked and then the attempt is over. Uh, and also, John White wounded. He'd taken two wounds and all that. Uh, wounded the head and a bullet to the thigh. So now they arrive back in England on May 22nd. White realizes he would not make it back to Virginia at all in 1588. Oh, man. Uh, 
Elsewhere in 1588, uh, July 29th, 1588, King Philip's Armada is seen off the coast of Cornwall. August 8th, the entire English Navy meets the famous Spanish Armada, engage him in battle. August 18th, the seemingly invincible Spanish Armada has been defeated. Great news for England, and finally, maybe some good news for White, right? It's been 18 months since White had left Roanoke. No ship had made it to the colonists from England with provisions. But now, now the Spanish Armada has been defeated. Surely, they could send ships of provisions to Roanoke now, right? No, wrong. By January of 1589, Raleigh was losing interest in his new American colony. He was preoccupied with settling 42,000 acres in Ireland that he was awarded in 1587. Uh, he's also being replaced as the object of Queen Elizabeth's affection by the dashing 23-year-old Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex. Uh, in December of 1588, Raleigh challenges Devereux to a duel, but the damn Privy Council intervenes and prevents it from taking place. Fucking duels, man. What is it with duels lately? Really starting to understand the dueling tradition uh, behind old suck subject Doc Holliday's life, right? He was born into it. Just why Johnny Ringo, you look like someone just walked over your grave. Why Robert Devereaux, you look like someone trying to steal my sweet desert puss. Hey, Lucifer. Uh, March of 1589, White, who uh, has to has to want to duel uh, Raleigh himself at this point for abandoning his daughter and granddaughter, does manage to pull together enough support finally for a voyage over to the colony. He's trying again. Raleigh actually has the nerve to be butthurt that White uh, found other backers, but he also doesn't want to invest his own money into backing the mission. He, he drafts a formal agreement in which Raleigh granted exclusive trading privileges with the city of Raleigh to a syndicate of 19 London merchants and supporters who had joined with John White, two assistants in England, and seven surviving assistants in Virginia. And they had to kind of get his permission because, remember, he still has that, like, seven-year hold. He's still in that window of having that seven-year hold on colonizing this area. Um then in mid-April of 1589, a massive fleet of merchant ships sets out for Roanoke, but it is yet again a complete failure. The trip has been poorly organized, and the ships just don't make it and have to go back. White has to be feeling nearly completely insane with frustration and worry at this point. He has been trying to get back to Roanoke for almost two years, and just his efforts are continually thwarted. He has to be worried sick. On February 1st, 1590, White is finally able to get passage on a boat headed to the West Indies. He persuades a group of privateers to bring him to Roanoke, he thinks. But he has been fucked yet again. It is unreal how unlucky these bastards were. Uh, the group that told him they were going to take him to Roanoke actually had no intention of actually heading there. At least not right away. Uh, they just told everyone that's where they were heading because the Privy Council still had a ban on various destinations. And telling them they were going to Roanoke was about the only way they could get out and, uh, and get out to sea. So they, so they used John. They, they were actually just privateers interested in treasure, and, uh, and Roanoke didn't have any they were looking for. So they went, instead, they went and plundered ships for months around the Canary Islands and the Azores. And then finally, after doing that for a while, White convinces some of these privateers to sail for Roanoke. And then White finally, finally, finally lands on Roanoke on August 18th, 1590. Uh, right? It's been, it's been three years Three years since the colony was abandoned. The settlement, he finds, is deserted. The house is dismantled. The colonists gone. His first response, of course, utter dismay. dismay. Yeah, utter dismay. <laughs> Jeez, I couldn't say that. He dreaded finding the settlement abandoned. Uh, but and then he thinks, you know, what had forced these settlers to leave? But as he looked around, he, he finds a, a gradual sense of relief because there was no sign that the settlement had been attacked. The palisade built by the settlers was intact. He discovers the word, you know, Croatoan carved on one of the main gateposts without any cross or sign of distress that would have indicated the settlers had been in grave danger. As they continued to look around the site, Cook's men, uh, 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 this is the captain he's with, found uh, iron bars, a couple pieces of lead, four fowlers, which is from is a cannon, saker shot, uh, other heavy gear scattered about. Uh, it was all almost overgrown with grass and weeds. It looked like it had been abandoned a while back. Uh, but at least he is there. At least there's no dis you know, sign, that the, or sign that they had been attacked. Now, uh, you know, White can look around, try and find his daughter and granddaughter, right? No, even more bad luck. A terrible storm strikes that night and damages their boats. So much boat damage, so many storms. And then the crew is like, we can't stay here, sorry. And they have to head back for England the next day. And then White goes with them. How much does that suck? He was not able to make it to the uh, Croatoan village, you know, where they had left sign that maybe they'd headed to check and see if that's actually where they went, to see if that's where his daughter, son-in-law, granddaughter, and those other colonists uh, had re relocated to. If he had just been able to stay a few more days, there might not be a mystery of Roanoke. It might have been solved right away. Just damn it, Lucifina. Why? So close. How low were his spirits on the journey back to England? Can't even imagine. He arrives back in Plymouth in late October. Uh, he, he writes in a letter, my fifth and last voyage to Virginia. 
which is what they were calling, you know, the area around Roanoke at that time, which was no less unfortunately ended than forwardly begun, and as luckless to many as sinister unfortunate to myself. Then that summer, 1590, more bad news regarding more journeys to Roanoke. Sir Walter Raleigh falls in love with Elizabeth Bess Throckmorton, one of the Queen's uh, maids of honor. Uh, At Elizabeth's court, disloyalty was not tolerated, and in the Queen's view, there could be no greater personal affront than a clandestine affair between one of her maids and one of her male favorites. Uh, by the summer of 1591, Bess was pregnant, and they could do—excuse uh, me—they could no longer hide the affair. The queen is pissed, places uh, Sir Walter Raleigh under house arrest, then puts uh, both him and Bess in the Tower of London, uh, imprisoned, and then the, they're released in 1592. But then Sir, uh, Sir Walter is banned from the queen's presence. So now there is no hope that Raleigh is ever going to get permission to uh, be granted another charter, you know, be granted uh, more permission to arrange another fleet to ever set sail for Roanoke again. So now the colony uh, that he had begun has been officially and totally abandoned. Pretty messed up, right? You know, you, just, you, don't, you don't abandon the lives of the people you're supposed to protect. Even Chicken Joe knows that. Where's he been? Well, he just popped in the suck dungeon. Bog, bog, playboy, bog, bog. It ain't right, leave your flock to the wolves like that. Even a young man don't produce, don't toss his ass in the ditch like a man, piece of expired roast beef. Kick him in like dust under the mat. You find a new use for that to boost? Maybe find a fetish connoisseur, turn that loose. Uh, leave me in the street, fend for itself. That's the number one way pimp ends up catching dust on a shelf. Now, nah, playboy, find a new ship, uh, get a grip of sailors, made that trip. Well, it's hot, hotter than me, hotter than my smooth ass chicken, every can be. Uh, see, fight for yours, always playboy, always forever. No time to slide on that, never. John White should have, uh, taken the back of his strong hand in the weak ass land of Walter's weak ass face. Ba ba, playboy, ba ba. Uh, that was Chicken Joe speak for, uh, how could Sir Walter Raleigh abandon his colonists? Even a pimp would never abandon the people he's made a deal with to protect. And Chick and Joe thinks that John White should have pressed Walter Harder to do right by his colonists. Uh, I think it was a little more complicated than that for Raleigh. Uh, he had a lot going on. He had a lot of circumstances outside of control. But Chick and Joe thinks what Chick and Joe thinks. Uh, his pet chicken, looking extra sharp today, by the way. Never seen an actual chicken wear platform high heels with goldfish in them before. Uh, impressive. And now back to John White. Little is known of John White after he returned to England after his final voyage uh, to Roanoke. He allegedly never gave up hope that the colonists found a way to survive. Uh, I'm sure he didn't. Uh, you know, and then he uh, he's believed to have died in Plymouth, England around 1593. And then 17 years after Roanoke is abandoned in 1607, the English return to what is now the United States. The Virginia Company of London is established in 1606, and then three ships carrying 105 settlers are dispatched in December to, uh, to found a colony on uh, Chesapeake Bay. They, they create Jamestown, making landfall on April 26, 1607. Unlike Roanoke, it lasts. And now let's hop out of this timeline to look into what may have happened to the lost colonists of Roanoke. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. So what happened to those settlers? If you'll remember from the beginning, it would be over a hundred years after the initial settlement attempt before more English pioneers would ever explore the island again. By that time, any clues to the disappearance of those initial settlers are going to be really, really gone. Uh, so let's uh, let's look into the leading possibilities for what happened to those colonists who, who we at least know uh, never established a British colony that lasted until the descendants of the original settlers eventually came into contact with future British colonists. Uh, we know that. We know they never built some proper little British town that lasted for any length of time because eventually someone would have obviously found that town or the remnants of that town. Uh, we also know they never eventually found uh, some miraculous way to get back across the Atlantic and make it back to England. There will be a record of that as well. So here's the first uh, of a few possibilities of what might have happened to the lost colony. Uh, when considering causes for social and demographic uh, kind of calamities, traditionally, just historically, four general possibilities, war, famine, pestilence, and death. Uh, there's a good chance that all four of these combined to bring the Elizabethan uh, Virginia colonists, a.k.a. the uh, Roanoke colony, to an end. Fear of being discovered by the Spanish may have caused them uh, to move further inland. Uh, John White suspected that a move 50 miles further up into Maine had been intended. Uh, and it's not 50 miles from Maine, but that's what they thought was Maine. But uh, the nearby mainland uh, American Indians were clearly hostile by 1587 towards the uh, settlers. Remember that dude who went crabbing? Ended up eating over a dozen arrows instead of some scrumptious crab legs. 
This local threat was another reason to leave Roanoke. Uh, we know that Lane's soldiers in 1586 faced a serious food shortage and that White in 1587 returned to England because uh, some supplies had been ruined to get them more food. The civilian colony had no real leverage to convince uh, you know, local tribes to share any of their winter reserves of food. Uh, later, famine would almost destroy Jamestown when uh, American Indians there refused to sell food, and the same situation could have taken down the Roanoke settlements. In Jamestown, disease, even the plague itself, would again and again sap the strength of the young colony. Infectious diseases may have had similar, even more destructive impact at Roanoke. So disease, famine could have easily pushed the colonists outside their forts, right into war with local tribes not happy with them. Uh, another possibility is that they uh, relocated to a new settlement and then died of what I just described in the first possibility— in 2012, First Colony Foundation, a group of historians and archaeologists researching Raleigh's American colonies, asked the British Museum to examine paper patches on a map uh, drawn by John White for Sir Walter Raleigh. The museum staff, dis uh, staff discovered beneath the symbol of a Renaissance fort, and upon the patch surface, they, they noted the faint image of a little fortified town, perhaps drawn in invisible ink. The patch was located at the west end of the uh, Albemarle Sound, about 50 miles from Roanoke Island. And then remote sensing and field work by FCF uh, revealed no such fort in a five-mile-wide area in the location that they uh, discovered the, the supposed invisible ink on the map. But teams did unearth metal objects, Tudor period domestic pottery in one spot adjacent to a contemporary Algonquian village. I think I may have been pronouncing Algonquian wrong earlier, by the way. Damn it! Uh, because the pottery would not have been able to be carried by Lane soldiers in 1586, uh, First Colony Foundation researchers announced in 2015 that Site X was the probable location of at least a few members of the Lost Colony for a limited period of time. So maybe, maybe some of them, you know, formed a new little settlement and then, and then, you know, probably died there of the reasons I explained earlier. Another possible fate for the colonists was being killed by the Spanish. The Spanish did have a settlement just down the coast in Florida. It's certain that the Spanish in the West Indies were aware of the English colonists' presence. One Roanoke settler named Darby Glond uh, left the uh, 1587 expedition once it set ashore in Puerto Rico to take on supplies, and then he later reported that he told Spanish officials uh, the location of the Roanoke settlement. So did the Spaniards find them and kill them? Uh, maybe. Although no archaeological evidence or historical record points to them doing this. Uh, there then, of course, is the possibility of the Roanoke recluse spider. Do you remember that? We talked about that a few sucks ago. Uh, if, you're, if you recall, the, the Roanoke recluse was known to, uh, to go for the eyes, ears, mouth, very aggressive spider, uh, now extinct because a bite in, you know, in those areas would send the poison straight to your brain. And when one spider would bite you, it would, it would release a chemical compound that would attract other spiders, and they would do like a swarm on you. And you would end up just covered. Just, just think about that right now. Just feel it. Feel so many spiders on your body. It's hundreds, if not thousands of spiders crawling into your mouth as you're screaming. You know, they, they love to go straight for the eyes. One, one spider would often lift up your eyelid and then let other little spiders crawl under your eyeball. Just feel that right now. Just imagine with your third eye, spiders crawling on your eyeball. God, that was terrible when I made up that story about a fake spider killing all those real colonists, you know. Uh, so, so since I made that story up, there's very little chance that that would solve the mystery. Uh, back, back to reality, in the opinion of John Hopkins, uh, university anthropologist Lee Miller, the colonists wandered into a, into a violent shift in the balance of power amongst uh, some inland tribes. And, you know, American Indians with whom the colonists were friendly uh, lost their hold over the area. And then uh, other American Indians hostile to the settlers took control. If the Roanoke colonists made the trip inland when this happened, the men would have likely been killed, the women and children captured as slaves. The colonists would have been traded along a route that spanned the U.S. coast from present-day Georgia to Virginia. So really, again, this goes back to that first explanation, just a variation there. Another theory not very popular is they tried sailing home, and then they drowned along the way. Highly doubtful. Uh, they weren't shipbuilders, and they didn't have a ship built for taking a group that large across the Atlantic. No legit historian seemed to really believe in this possibility. Uh, I don't think they would do something that desperate because it's, I think they would probably uh, be, be smart enough to know that would be certain death. Uh, a popular theory that a lot of people, historians included, do seem to believe in is assimilation. And a variation of this is my favorite. Uh, as published in National Geographic in 2015, two independent teams found archaeological remains suggesting that at least some of the Roanoke colonists might have survived and split into two groups, each of which assimilated itself into a different American Indian community. One team is excavating a site near Cape Creek on Hatteras Island, about 50 miles southeast of the Roanoke Island settlement, while the other is based on the mainland about 50 miles to the northwest of the Roanoke site. Uh, Cape Creek, located in an oak forest near uh, Pamlico Sound, was the site of a major Croatoan town center trading hub 
1998, archaeologists from East Carolina University stumbled upon a unique find from early British America, a 10-carat gold signet ring engraved with a lion or horse believed to date to the 16th century. Now, later testing in 2017 did reveal the ring is actually copper, not gold, is originally believed. But that doesn't seem to really change the significance of the find. If anything, copper rings more common for the class of settlers coming across the Atlantic in the, in the late 16th century. So gold or copper, the ring's discovery prompted later excavations at the site led by Mark Horton, an archaeologist at Britain's Bristol University who has been directing volunteers with the Croatoan Archaeological Society in annual digs since 2009. Recently, Horton's team found a small piece of slate that seems to have been used as a writing tablet and, part of a, uh, and they also found part of the hilt of an iron rapier, a light sword similar to those used in England in the late 16th century, along with other artifacts of European and American Indian origin. The slate, smaller version of a similar one found at Jamestown, bears a small letter M, still barely visible in one corner. It was found alongside a lead pencil. In addition to these intriguing objects, the Cape Creek site yielded an iron bar and a large copper ingot, uh, both found buried in layers of earth that appear to date to the late 1500s. American Indians lacked such metallurgical technology, so they are believed to have been a European in origin. Horton told National Geographic that some of the artifacts his team found are trade items, but it appears that others may have well belonged to the Roanoke colonists themselves. The evidence is that they assimilated with the American Indians but kept their goods. Going further into the assimilation possibility is the most intriguing possibility to me about what happened. And this is the theory of the Lumbee tribe of American Indians. This theory is that over the course of generations, intermarriage between the natives and the English survivors of Roanoke produced a new culture, new tribe, the Lumbee tribe. The Lumbee tribe, native to North Carolina, uh, yet no certain lineage can be pinned down. The tribe's oral history does link them to the Roanoke settlers, and this tradition is supported by some of their surnames and the tribe's ability to read and write English. Uh, family names of some of the Roanoke colonists, like Dial, Hyatt, Taylor, were shared by Lumbee tribe members as early as 1719. The settlers who met them were astonished to find American Indians that had gray eyes and spoke English. I found a graduate research paper conducted, uh, or I guess completed, by a student at UC Davis that cited a lot of excellent books and governmental studies in the 1970s, other sources that do make the case that the colonists, at least some of them, really did become absorbed by the Lumbee tribe. This doesn't seem to be some wackadoodleness. To me, this one feels like best case possibility. Two cultures merging into one. I hope that's what happened. I really do. Uh, there are other possibilities of what happened, though, as well, to the Roanoke colonists. And, and if you if you want to find those, you got to dig into the idiots of the internet. Idiots of the internet. First video I looked at today uh, shows a 43-minute documentary created for the History Channel called The Lost Colony of Roanoke, posted by user DocSpot. And user Charlie Romeo, 2009, seems to not understand the significance of over 100 people vanishing. Posting simply, people disappear every day. Uh, yeah, true, Charlie, very true. Usually like one person, though, uh, at a time. Usually not over 100 people altogether. And usually not 100 people who have moved to a very specific area for the very specific purpose of staying in that area and building a settlement in that area. It's not like they were all dropped off in a mall and then just kind of wandered off to start new lives themselves, which would also be totally ridiculous. I wonder. I just wonder if this is how Charlie reacts to other extreme events, you know? Charlie, what do you think happened with 9-11? <laughs> uh, buildings fall. Whatever. It's normal. Buildings fall every day. Uh, yeah, buildings do fall, but not like that, buddy. Not like that. I just love certain people's reactions and stuff. Uh, user Joey S. doesn't seem to understand the concept of, con of context or of racism. Posting, y'all a bunch of racists talking about Indians had blue eyes, etc. And everyone says race doesn't matter. Obviously it does. Ah, it matters in regard to solving this mystery, Joey. If some American Indians had blue eyes when they met English settlers years after Roanoke, it would imply there was uh, European genetics in their bloodline, which would mean they'd encountered and interbred with Europeans. Probably, uh, at least possibly, the Roanoke settlers, since prior to Europeans, full-blooded American Indians did not have blue-colored blue eyes. Also, uh, it's not racist to point out the genetic features of someone else, uh, you know, or point out, like, their racial features. I've always found that argument so just illogical and dumb. Like, uh, and, and some people get so worked up about shit like this. Like, like, if you're at a party and someone asks you to point out your friend Mike to them, and Mike is the one very white guy— the very obviously white guy standing in a group of three dark-skinned black guys, four Asian guys, and two dark-skinned Latino guys. And they're all similarly dressed, similar ages, right? It's, it's not racist to say, oh, yeah, he's the, uh, he's the white dude standing there. 
That's just the easiest way to discern him from the other people. That's the easiest way to identify him in a crowd. You're just letting your friend know uh, in as few words as possible who Mike is. And his race is the most distinguishing feature in that particular setting. Uh, I think it's stupid in that situation when some people just get so fucking nervous. Like, uh, he's the um, he's the guy uh, uh, with the jeans. He's wearing the, the jeans. No, not that guy. Uh, the guy with – he has the brown hair. No, no, no. Not, not that guy. His hair is, is straighter than – no, uh, not, huh, not that straight. Um, he has a – he's the least tan of the – get the fuck out. Uh, when people say, I don't see uh, – like, I don't see color, that phrase, they don't literally mean that unless they're colorblind or an idiot. We all see color. Uh, what color someone is just doesn't matter to some of us. Uh, user uh, Wampus Dub isn't happy with the quality of the documentary. It's pretty shitty. It was. Uh, and post something that's not stupid. I just found it funny. He just posted a RIP History Channel. Oh, man. Exactly. Wampus Dub. Exactly. Uh, what fucking happened to that channel? It used to be good like a decade ago. Okay. Uh, one more video. There's a nice, quick video summary of what may have happened to the lost colonists on YouTube called simply The Roanoke Colony, posted by That Was History. Uh, actually, it seems like a good channel for kids. No joke. Uh, just some dude. I don't know. He looked like he was maybe senior in high school age, junior, maybe a little bit older. You know, late teens, early 20s, and uh, just, you know, kind of concisely broke it down, uh, I thought, very intelligently. The host presents the possibilities we just went over and then asks listeners to put whatever they think happened to the colonists in the comment section. And user Stormcloud solves the case. Fucking it's over. Archaeologists, don't even w- worry about it anymore. We got it. We got it. He posts, guys, I figured it out. I saw some other videos on this subject, and one said that Sir Walter Raleigh told the colonists to leave a mark on a tree where they want or no, excuse me, to, to leave a mark on a tree where they went. And if you go back to the beginning with the map, uh, and you look, sorry, this, it's written so horribly, it's hard to read. If you go back to the beginning of with the map and look closely and pause the video, you can see the word Croatone in the bottom left. Now, I'm not sure about the buildings, but I assume they took the buildings with them. Uh, yeah, mystery solved. Thanks, Storm Clouds. Archaeologists still haven't come to a definitive 100% for sure conclusions, but you fucking you nailed it. Uh, as if everyone else overlooked that, as if everyone else just didn't realize there was a map that one of the people there was holding with like an X, like a, like a silly Scooby-Doo treasure map that would lead everybody to the, to the answer for sure. Guys, guys, they wrote Croatone on a fence post, and that is also on the map. Just follow, guys, just follow the map to Croatone. It's so easy. Am I really that much smarter than everyone else? No, no, Stormclad, you're not. At least not in this example. You're really not. How funny would that be if just like if that really was the answer and then and then somebody's like, oh, fuck, we just got to follow the little – like there was like the little dashes like on an old school treasure map and then someone just finally followed it and there was a whole town there of people still living like uh, like in the, in the 16th century. Just, oh, gosh, shit. We forgot to – sorry, you guys. Sorry it took us 400 years to find you. Everyone just forgot to follow the, the map. Every, no one knew how to read a treasure map. Um, user Madeline Gager is really not good at solving mysteries. She posts, my theory is that maybe the word Croatoan means something like help us, and maybe they were captured, and that word is what the last man wrote to show John White where they were. Are you fucking kidding me, Madeline? Are you, are you related to Stormcloud? How could you possibly think that everyone else has overlooked that? And, <laughs> and how do you not understand that's, that's the name of the nearby tribe? They've said that, they said that in the video you just watched like 20 fucking times. Please do not ever get pregnant with Stormcloud Baby. Dear God, that kid, that kid would have zero chance in life. Uh, a little ways down the thread, Madeline uh, takes another stab at attempting to solve the mystery of the uh, lost colony. Uh, and it's even worse than her first attempt. She writes, another theory is maybe the Native Americans or something were trying to say that that is their land and they don't want any new people living there because maybe they thought they were going to come live with them and that... They were trying to say that they don't need any more people in the village. What are you even talking about, Madeline? What, what does any of what you just wrote have to do with them disappearing? If they didn't want them to live in their village, they would just not let them live in their village. What does it have to do with the colonists leaving their own settlement? How, how are you able to work a phone or a computer, right, or, or like an iPad? How are you able to leave these comments? Where are your parents? Find them. Find them and tell them they need you to make you. They need to make you study harder in school. Okay, focus more on what your teachers are telling you to do in school and, and less on dicking around YouTube. Finally, Madeline Gager strikes again, posting something that makes uh, even less sense than the previous two posts. I love this. She says, "Or 
My other theory is maybe they were trying to spell in English, but they didn't know how to spell. So they got all the letters mixed up. The absurdity of this one makes me laugh so hard. I mean, I guess maybe I guess maybe there's a chance that Madeline is talking about the uh, American Indians being the ones uh, who wrote, you know, uh, Croto in there. But I like to, I like to think just based on her earlier post that she's actually talking about the colonists themselves here. You know, like that she thinks that there's over 100 settlers and yet none of them knew how to spell their own in their own language. So they just started carving random letters in the wood. <laughs> like that's their signal. Why would anyone try and do that? You just you would just write, draw a picture if you didn't know the language. We need to tell them we're going, but we're all illiterate. So what? R- write some letters. You've seen them before. Carve them. People who are good at letters will figure it out. What letters? Any of them. Just any of them. Just hope that it spells we're hungry and we left to look for food. Okay. All right. Okay. I got it. Hungry. Uh, hungry. Uh, mm, C. C. Uh, uh, left to look for food. Uh, R. Yes. Yes. I think R spells left to look for food. Uh, no, just, just draw some pictures. Just draw a fucking picture. I want you to do that, Madeline. I want you to go draw some pictures. At the moment, uh, solving mystery just does not seem to be your thing. Idiots of the internet. 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 I do think that Madeline may just be a kid, by the way. I just just thought her her funny. I'm hoping. I'm hoping she's not like, uh, you know, 35 years old and in charge of something in a fucking, you know, business. She's like a... You know, VP, some important company. Oh, God. Uh, And, of course, there's still more possibilities in the stuff I went over. Uh, Last thing I'll mention about that is in 1937, a California tourist walked into the history department of Emory University, Atlanta, with a 21-pound engraved rock he said he'd found in the swamp while traveling through North Carolina. It immediately caught the eye of Haywood Pierce, Jr., Emory professor. And on one side, the engraving appears to be a grave marker reading... Uh, Ananias, Dare, and Virginia went hence unto heaven, 1591. Uh, Anye, it's, it's written really weird. And any, any Englishman shoe, any, oh, any Englishman show John White, governor of Virginia. is what it looks like it's trying to say. On the other side, the inscription was much longer and appeared to address White as father. Soon after you go for England, we came hither. Um, and then it's fucking such a weird version of English. I don't even know. Only misery. Oh, I. Only, only misery and war to ye. Ye salvages, feign spirits, angry, sudden, murther. I'll save Stephen, mine child, Ananias, to slain with much misery. So it seems to be, and it was signed E-W-D, uh, as in uh, Eleanor White Dare, John White's daughter. So who knows? Uh, you know, maybe, uh, they, again, that just kind of goes back to the possibility earlier. They, they got away for a little bit, maybe started a new settlement, but then were were murdered. Uh, or or maybe there was a demonic witch who looks a lot like Lady Gaga that floated over with the colonists from Europe as a stowaway and brought a curse upon the colonists, brought a curse upon the land. Like in season six of American Horror Story, it's the butcher. The butcher did it. Uh, what do I think? I like the Lumbee story. It makes me feel the best, and it's the only one uh, there that, that appears to have some real evidence behind it. You know, uh, nothing conclusive. But how else did that tribe acquire European features? How did their language, you know, feature elements of English? How do they know how to speak English? You know, before meeting other other uh, Europeans back in the early 1700s uh, without having uh, met the uh, Roanoke colonists. And, you know, how do they have their how, – how are their eyes not brown? Uh, if, in fact, that is all true, which it, which it does appear to be. Um, last thing now before uh, top five takeaways. What happened to Sir Walter Raleigh, the man who abandoned the colony? Well, upon his release from the Tower of London, Raleigh hoped to recover his position with the queen. And in 1594, he was able to lead an unsuccessful expedition to Guyana. Now Venezuela to search for El Dorado, this fabled legendary uh, city of gold. Uh, the expedition produced a little gold, but subsequent forays to Cadiz and the Azores uh, reinstated him with the queen. Uh, Sir, Wal- Sir Walter Raleigh, though, wasn't well liked by her successor, as we said, King James I. And Raleigh's enemies worked to taint his reputation with the new king, and he was soon charged with treason and condemned to death. However, the sentence was commuted to imprisonment in the tower again in 1603. And he lived there with his wife and servants. So weird. So he was imprisoned in the tower, but got to, like, he didn't get to leave, but he did get to live with his wife and had some servants. And he wrote The History of the World in 1614. Strange life, this guy. He was released in 1616, 
So he spent fucking 13 years there. Uh, to search for, again for gold in South America. Against the king's approval, he invaded and pillaged Spanish territory and then was forced to return to England without any uh, treasure, was arrested on the orders of the king. His original death sentence for treason was reinstated, and he was executed at Westminster in 1618 at the age of 65. And he never got to suckle upon another teat again. And now it is time for Top 5 Takeaways. Time suck. Top 5 Takeaways. Number one, in 1587, Englishman John White led a group of 118 colonists to what was uh, supposed to be a brief stay in Roanoke. And 115 of those colonists were never seen again when White returned to England to get word to Sir Walter Raleigh that they desperately needed more supplies. Number two, the initial exploratory uh, expedition to Roanoke in the summer of 1584 was the first time the British would see the land that would morph in the United States, the first time the English would lay eyes upon American Indians living in present-day United States, and everyone got along splendidly for that one trip and then uh, would never coexist like that again. Number three, on August 18, 1590, John White returned to Roanoke three years after leaving to get supplies and found the settlement completely deserted. The word Croatoan carved into a fence post, an important clue and a mystery he would never solve, having to return to England the next day due to a storm. Number four, people have speculated on what happened to the members of the lost colony for over 400 years. Their remains were never found. Maybe the Spanish got them. Maybe they were killed by local tribes. Maybe they were taken in by a local tribe, a tribe known as the Lumbee tribe, or maybe something else entirely. It is, after all, still a mystery. Number five, New info, little innocent Virginia Dare, that first English baby born in present-day America, the little baby whose fate would, you know, will likely forever be a mystery, has long been used as a symbol and rallying point for white supremacist groups. Seriously, the name Virginia Dare long associated with various white nationalist groups. Uh, it started really in, in an 1837 magazine story, Eliza Lansford Cushing coined the term Lost Colony and created this legend of a fair-skinned Virginia dazzling the swarthy Indians with her beauty and skill. But Virginia remained chaste, keeping their uncontrolled passions, like the uncontrolled passions of the American Indians, at bay. And the story spawned a genre of the virginal white woman being hunted, being chased by non-white agents of foreign subversion. And in the 1830s, an influx of non-British immigrants alarmed white Americans. Race relations were volatile and violent. Tens of thousands of American Indians forced uh, west in that trail of tears, as we learned last week. Nat Turner led a slave rebellion that was brutally suppressed. Uh, the plight of an innocent white girl wandering the dark forest among, amongst uh, lusty savages spoke to Americans who worried that people of British heritage were losing their grip on the young republic. Soon newspapers were referring to the first Anglo-American, Ms. Virginia Dare. And then her popularity spiked again at the turn of the 20th century when more than one million immigrants each year flooded into the U.S., prompting again white fears of race suicide. Italians and Jews made up the bulk of the new arrivals, typically uh, not considered whites. In a 1901 best-selling poem called The White Doe by Sally Southall Cotton, an evil Indian shaman, one of the slaves of superstition, turns Virginia, the heir of civilization, into a white doe. She eventually dies a tragic death to pave the way for British domination of the savage continent. Uh, at the 1907 exposition celebrating Jamestown's 300th anniversary, uh, Virginia Dare hailed in the North Carolina exhibit as the infant child of pure Caucasian blood who launched the birth of the white race in the Western Hemisphere. Even now, white supremacists and their allies claim Virginia Dare as their, as their own, uh, currently mostly through the website vdare.com. A uh, website described by critics as being white supremacist. The folks at the Southern Poverty Law Center list VDARE as a hate group, specifically an anti-immigration hate website that regularly publishes articles by prominent white nationalists, race scientists, and anti-Semites. So while we don't know what happened to the real Virginia Dare, we do know what happened to her legacy. It was co-opted by a bunch of aggressively ignorant assholes. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Roanoke sucked. Love a mystery. And a good excuse to learn more about American history, which I knew so tragically little about two years ago when I started this project. Almost exactly two years ago. Ah, it's been two years that suck now. Uh, and to think I initially fought so hard to keep it from being a history podcast. Ah, oh, man. And, uh, and man, so fun. It's, it, it's fun to have a little moment of reflection here. Just uh, two years ago, you know, it's that first episode. Just, yeah, some, uh, m you know, minimal equipment. 
on a on a used uh, little kitchen table that I had because kind of janky. One of the little uh, uh, wings didn't work quite right. Sitting in this uh, dumpy little uh, West LA apartment, and now in the suck dungeon. In the suck dungeon, got a bunch of cool shit surrounding me. Pretty sweet, you guys. Pretty sweet. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks again to the Time Suck team, the High Priestess of the Suck, Harmony Velikamp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Doctor Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alex Dugan, the guys at Bit Elixir, the team Danger Brain, Space Scissors, Merch Wizards, Access Apparel, Queen of the Suck, and Boss of Everything, <laughs> Lindsay Cummins. Uh, I gotta get the Bit Elixir guys some kind of nickname. Uh, big big thanks to Bojangles Research Assistant Heather Knowledge Ninja Rylander. Another very sharp meat sack. Uh, so what's up next week? Well, next week, we really get into October. Uh, with, a, with a proper October suck. Uh, another mystery, a darker one, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden, in all likelihood, brutally murdered her father and stepmother with an axe on August 4th, 1892, when she was 22 years old. The case was big-time national news. Uh, the trail was, or the trial, the trail, the trial was closely covered by papers across the country. Uh, the trial has been compared to like the O.J. Simpson trial in terms of just national interest and coverage. And while she was convicted, uh, you know, by the court of public opinion, she was acquitted by the jury, and then stayed in the little town where she supposedly killed her uh, her folks uh, for the rest of her life. Did did she do it? Uh, and if not, who did it? Uh, we'll look at the crime, the trial, and the strange details of Lizzie's life next Monday. And now let's hear from you. Find out what I messed up, uh, you know, last week in today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. Get them. Get them right here. Uh, Today's first update is a terminology update coming from across the pond from Scottish Sucker. Kieran Shields. Kieran writes, Dear Gloria Sack of Bojangles, just finished listening to your Andrew motherfucking Jackson suck and was happy to find out the origin of redneck and hillbilly comes from my own kind. No offense was taken by this and I found it pretty funny since Scotland is known for being a bit rough. I wouldn't usually write in to correct your mush mouth, but when the word scotch is used more than once, I feel the need to intervene. Scotch is an adjective to describe items like whiskey or food, scotch pie, scotch egg, etc. For some bizarre reason, it's a bit of a trigger. When we're called this uh, in, in relation to our Anglo neighbors, which can strike a nerve. Oh, as it's usually in relation to our Anglo neighbors, uh, Anglo neighbors, which can strike a nerve. Uh, for the sake of your heritage, use Scottish or Scots to describe the mighty nation of rain and Irn Brew in the future. Uh, Irn, maybe Irn Brew. Uh, hope this widens your wealth of knowledge and please keep these episodes coming. Big love, a Scottish sucker. Oh, thank you, man. I got I to gotta get to Scotland someday. Man, I got to get up there. I, uh... They had this Edinburgh festival. I don't know if I'd want to do that because it's a month long. It's a little bit hard with the kids, but I but I got to get to Edinburgh one of these days. Well, thanks and apologies, Kieran. Uh, yeah, Scotch was a term used in some of the older sources I was uh, using for the episode. I had no idea that it'd become a derogatory term. I would have never guessed that, especially since I'm a big fan of Scotch uh, whiskey. Uh, that word has only positive associations for me. Now I know, uh, and now I know a little bit about my uh, a little more about my heritage. I got to do a family tree. I got this box 23 and me sitting at home, and then I got to find out some family tree stuff. Because I'm curious how, uh, you know, how much, uh, how Scottish I am. So glad you told me. Keep sucking over there in Scotland. Keep, keep spreading the suck across the pond. I appreciate it. Uh, and now, pronunciation connect, uh, correction from time sucker Jesse Lincoln, the first of a few today. Jesse writes Good morning, powerful leader of the suck and prophet of Nimrod. I'm not trying to be a stickler with this, but I'm in the middle of the Andrew motherfucking Jackson podcast. This is now the second podcast I listen to where you've mispronounced the word. Uh, brigadier, as in Brigadier General, you pronounce it with a hard G as, as you're saying Brigadier, but it's with a soft G like Brigadier, Brigadier General. I only email this to you because I know that this is not the last podcast where you'll be talking about military people or personnel or things of that nature. I hope I don't sound like too much of a douche right now. You don't. Uh, I, ho- I hope to shake your hand at the live podcast and to come on October 14th. Oh, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there right after the show. Uh, hail Nimrod. Have a good, good day. And bok bok, playboy. And bok bok. Uh, your faithful time sucker, uh, Jesse Lincoln. Yeah, Brigadier. Now, let's see if that sticks. Brigadier, not bridge. Brigadier, Brigadier. Uh, yeah, and again, not douchey. Uh, you know, I don't learn unless you guys correct me. Learning. One of the main points of all this, isn't it? Uh, yeah, thanks, man. And yes, we will be doing more military sucks down the road. Uh, Clayton Duckett wrote in with an update that I had a feeling was going to be uh, based on either my mush mouth or poor pronunciation abilities when I read the subject line of Jesus fucking Christ. That made me laugh very hard. Clayton wrote, DJ fucking suck. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has mentioned this, but in the Andrew Jackson suck, you pronounce Appalachian as Appalachian, which, peop- which, uh, which people who live where I'm from, Asheville, North Carolina, a.k.a. Bojangles Toilet Bowl, 
toilet bowl get very pissy if you pronounce it any other way than Appalachian. I myself slipped up during a stand-up show and had some hillbilly uh, butt baby yell at me from the crowd before he stormed out to his jacked-up truck and his sister wife. I'd love to see you come down here to the weirdest city in the South. Suck on and hail Nimrod. Thank you, Clayton. Yes, and hail Nimrod. You know, my defense, if you go to a site like dictionary.com, they pronounce it like I did. Uh, but if you go, if, if, if you find like actual Southerners saying it, like you can't, Forvo.com is an interesting pronunciation website because it's all like uh, user-based. It's all just people sending their submissions for what, you know, how to pronounce various words. Uh, and, and there, yes, you will hear Appalachian. Uh, would have never known that was the local way. And I would love to get back to Asheville, a little jewel of a city. I did a show uh, at a college there many years ago and really would like to get back. They have a fun festival there. Uh, I, I think it's still going every year called Laugh Your Asheville Off. And uh, it's known nationally for a great foodie scene. Uh, keep spreading the suck in Asheville. And it might just happen. Uh, and yeah, thank you again, Clayton. Uh, one more pronunciation update from Grant Cook. Grant writes in saying, Dear Sultan of Mispronunciation, Grand Prince of Garble, Master Mother Sucker, I just wanted to uh, inform you as a resident of North Carolina, uh, Salisbury, okay, I said Salisbury, Salisbury is pronounced Salisbury, not Salisbury. I'm not one for caring about these things, but seeing as your next suck is based in North Carolina, uh, here's your handy pronunciation guide. And he provides a link. And I, and I used your link this week, Grant. Thank you. I hope I hope I was a little better, at least better than last week. I do, I do think I've come a long way in the last two years of pronunciations, right? Uh, since the, uh, remember the uh, human genome project? Anyone remember that? Yeah, you know, we're getting better. Genome. Uh, okay, last one from John Rogers. This is regarding the racism uh, of Andrew Jackson uh, and the misdeeds of Andrew Jackson. Uh, John sent in a clever subject line of Andrew burning in hell not good as Linda, the saint, a Jackson. So if you recall, Linda from last week's edited to the internet. Uh, John writes, Dear Reverend Dr. Master Sucker Dan and the rest of the team, just want to start off by saying I love the show and appreciate all the long hours that go into each and every episode. The passion for knowledge shows within the cult of curious. Hail him right. Now, the reason I'm writing, I have hated Andrew Jackson for almost my entire life. I was blinded by my hatred, and I never bothered to look into anything else about him. Uh, you know, what I had uh, then about him than what I had to, oh yeah, for school. My hatred stemmed from the obvious reason, the trail of tears. My great, great grandfather, Benjamin Andrew Jesse Palmoon Kilgore, was born on the trail of tears and almost died on the trail. If he did, I would not exist. Because of this, I was basically an idiot of the internet without the internet. Time Suck has made me more open-minded to certain topics that I wouldn't have been otherwise. Listen to this episode, I realized he was actually a pretty badass and he's not an awful guy. He just did some things that today's society would frown upon. Keep bringing us that sweet suck and hail Nimrod, John Rogers. Well, th well thank you, John. You bring up uh, such an important point. First off, sorry that happened to a member of your family. It's a terrible tragedy. Trail of Tears, terrible, terrible uh, tragedy. Blight on our nation's history. Undeniably terrible. Uh, second, thank you uh, for seeing past it. Uh, I know my take on, on Jackson pissed off a number of you. And, and I think it's because, you know, we meat sacks can let our emotions get the best of us. It's natural. You know, and I just want to make it clear that I never said that Jackson's racial attitudes were good. Uh, or that all of the things he did were good, because they were not. His attitudes on race were deplorable, based on what we know today. And what he did with the Trail of Tears was disgusting, uh, based on what we know today, and, and hard to really even rationalize you know, in his own time. But as obvious as it seems to have such little respect for another human being as Jackson had for African Americans, or for certain American Indians, uh, it wasn't always obvious to not be like that. Like, we are all, to a certain extent, whether we want to admit it or not, Products of our environment and products of the times, you know, we live in. You know, there's a reason it's like nature versus nurture. Like, you know, there, there's our genetics and then, you know, the nurture, our environment. It, it plays a big part in who we are. You know, like, like uh, every Roman leader I can think of had slaves. That was part of their culture. Should, should we then now discount every deed or accomplishment every Roman emperor ever achieved? No. They never thought not to have slaves. It just wasn't what people did back then. It was not a part of life. Uh, to not do that. So, th so the point I wanted to make with Andrew Jackson was that, you know, you should judge someone by the standards of the time they lived in uh, because that's the only fair way to judge them. Many of the things we do today may somehow seem monstrous to a generation of people 500 years from now, but that doesn't make us monsters. Uh, and also, there's a weird thing culturally going on right now where it's like, you know, people will dig into, uh, you know, uh, somebody's social media feed from 10 years ago. They do this athletes a lot right now and find some deplorable thing they posted one time when they were 15 and want to crucify them uh, for that. And I think that is fucking ridiculous. I did, oh my God, if, if social media would have been around when I was a teenager, oh, I'd be fucking strung up 
for the shit I've said, just for shock value humor. No, and just for being a dumb shit teenager. Uh, I was a fucking idiot in so many ways. But, you know, that's, yeah, I was supposed to be. I was fucking 14, 15 years old. Um, it's just a weird cultural thing that I think is just really, really stupid to to want to uh, just uh, diminish someone to only the worst moments of their life. And that, and that's how they're defined, as if, as if there's nothing else they did matters. It is it is crazy to me what has gone on. Uh, you know, some some uh, some good in- intentioned movements that have a lot of good to them. Uh, I think it taken too far as things often do, and then a lot of you know you know uh, innocent people also get you know screwed over. But it's just um, yeah, it's like it's like a weird witch hunty vibe culturally right now that I uh, that I don't I'm not I'm not for. I'm not for it. I'm against the witch hunt. I was against it, uh, you know, in the Salem witch trials, and I'm against it now. Uh, so thank you for understanding, John. And it sounds like you have a very cool family tree. And thank everyone for today's Time Sucker updates. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. That's all for this week, you guys. You meat sacks, you beautiful bastards. Hail Nimrod, try not to get stranded in a foreign land without proper food and supplies. Uh, but if you do get stuck somewhere, please do me a favor and keep on sucking. <laughs>